That is so epic. All right, are you guys ready? Because I am ready. Um, We are going to obviously be continuing in our series, The Hero Challenge, where we are, my goal and my heart is that we would begin to put a focus and attention to the areas in our lives that, that we know need some massive action on our parts. Uh, we have information, we, we have knowledge, we have tools, and, and yet sometimes all of that stuff just isn't enough. I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, I have just gotten really excited, and for those who know me, they know when I get excited about something, I really, I just go all in. I get very invested. And so my wife and I started a project that she threw out to me, and I thought, you know, it was beyond my scope of really where I act day to day. And so she said, honey, let's build a table for Thanksgiving. And so she found some plans online and I thought this will be great. And so I decided to purchase some some tools to help me build that table. And uh, it just turned into some more excitement about tools and building stuff. And anyway, we finished the table. It's amazing. I know you're really interested. But one of the things that's funny is even when you have a plan and a blueprint, And even when you have all the tools right in front of you, you still can screw some things up. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And uh, so that project went well, and we ended up with a wonderful table in our backyard. Seats eight, it's great. You can get the plans online, and I can tell you about that later. But I decided to tackle another project at my house that didn't go quite so well, and now I'm having to call in reinforcements on that project. And so, unfortunately, I had the plans I had the instructions, even video instructions, and uh, all the tools were laid out, but for some doggone reason, I kept snapping off my bolt, bolts in my uh, studs in my garage. I'm, I'm putting in, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing, but <clears throat> bottom line is, is that I've managed to mess that whole thing up, and sometimes you and I have the same idea when it comes to the instruction book that we've been given. Now, we are alive at a time that is probably beyond any other time, our accessibility to information. Would you agree with that? I mean, you know, if you think back a few years, you know, beyond eight tracks and cassette recorders and all that stuff, when people actually, someone, as far as even just a, a pastor coming to church, where, where that pastor lived in a rural area, area, he had no radio, no anything, and he had to just come up with a message. But now I know I, I fight a battle. Because you can go online and listen to podcasts and sermons and videos and all kinds of stuff. And my level of communication has to, you know, I got I to gotta raise the roof on it. Raise the bar a little bit because I'm competing. And you can be like, oh, heard, we heard that, Brad. We heard, I heard something better. I read 17 books. I downloaded it to my Nook. I'm listening to a podcast right now and I'm just like, geez, you know. But even with all that information that we have, how many of you know with the information, with the tools that we've been given, we still have a propensity to just screw things up. How do I know this? Because I'm alive. <laughs> and I live, and you and I live in a culture that is, oh, I don't know, it's just totally chaotic. And this time of year is a time of year that's completely chaotic as well. And not only is there things like increased substance abuse and more and more just sort of violence in the home and frustrations, but I would say my evaluation of our relationship quotient, our ability to have, maintain, and to experience meaningful relationships has really gone downhill. I mean, I, I would say our ability to have friendships that are deep and rich, our ability to have people that we can count on and trust in, in some deeper sense than just something surface, has really gotten out of whack. And for the most part, the Bible gives us some, some great, great instructions and tools. But if we just have the instructions and the tools and we don't take any actual action on that stuff, then We're frustrated because we're wondering why there's no real change, and we're wondering why nothing's really happening, but you and I both know that with the blueprint and the plans and the tools, and you don't do anything proper or correct in your action and activity, then you're not going to see the fruits of a beautiful table in your backyard. You're going to be frustrated, and you're just going to have a lot of wood and scraps hanging around. Now, as we take that to our relationships, the Bible's very clear, and my gift for this Christmas season is going to be taking our hero challenge right into our relationships, because I want to give to you the gift 
of, of relationships, the gift of having um, an opportunity to extract the information and the tools and put them in, into practice and for your life to be transformed in the area of relationships. Because I believe it is one of the single, if not the area, that, that we as a group of people need to focus on, not only our relationship with others, but also understanding how to have a relationship with God. And we started off this year talking about how sometimes when we go to church, we can get a mindset that I'm going to live above or under God or I'm gonna live for him. And so we start doing church activity and now I'm living for God, but God didn't ask that from us. Actually, it puts us in a, a sort of a, a mixed up, confused relationship with him when we're living for him. And I wear WWJD bracelets and I do church activity and I sort of hold my banner because he says all he wants from you is a relationship with him. He wants to walk this life with you. He wants to go on the journey with you. He wants to be with you every day in a relationship where you have the opportunity to talk to him and to hear from him. And that is the value and the benefit and the beauty of having a God who loves us 100%. But now he opens up and gives us information into our significant, meaningful relationships in our lives because he knows that it is the single greatest area of pain for sure. Now, the Bible, first off, and, and Jesus gives us a, a few insights. One insight that I find um, interesting, especially in our current culture and time, is he says that it's impossible that offenses come. If you're a football fan, you know defense. This is ah fence. Okay, anyway, never mind. Um, offenses will come. He says that we are going to have offenses. There is going to be a barrage in our life of opportunity for us to be offended. Now, most of us, when we think about this, we think grand scale as opposed to tiny little items that cause problems in situations. The snubs, the lack of invitation, the Facebook post that, what did they mean by that? The uh, sneer, the bigger items where somebody says something and does something to us um, that causes us to go into a spin, tailspin emotionally that creates a massive amount of frustration and angst. And Jesus says, it's impossible that offenses come. Now, I'd like for it to say, if you follow Jesus, you will never have the chance or moment to be offended. It does not say that. I wish it said that when you follow Jesus, your life becomes a flowery bed of ease and just, you know, fluffiness, but he doesn't say that. Jesus says that you're going to have offenses. Pain is going to happen. In other words, it's inevitable. You're going to go through some junk. Anybody ever been through hard times, difficult circumstances that cause pain in your life? Anybody come from a dysfunctional home where mom and dad weren't the perfect picture of everything that they should be for you? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller, Bueller, all of you. Pain is inevitable. But he goes on to give us insight and says that while pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. While you're going to experience some stuff in life, Jesus goes on to say in the same passage that offenses are going to come. He tells us to take heed and to beware those of you who are offended. I wish that he would have taken more time to deal with those rat punks who offend us, but he puts more attention to those of us who are actually offended. Now hang tight, because what I'm going to share with you like I said, is going to rock your world and will change your life in the area of relationships and will cause the, the inevitable suffering that you've been going through and been hanging on to to disappear today. It has the chance to disappear and you have a, a, a moment to be able to grasp a hold of peace and happiness that God promises us through Scripture and we're going to see how it unfolds. All right? So... If you're taking notes, you will write down, pain is inevitable, suffering 
is optional. Say that back to me. All right. Now, most of us, when we get into a situation where we are offended, where somebody has done something to us that has hurt us or has caused us to feel a certain way, most of us believe that the rules for happiness and peace, they get adjusted. We think that based on the fact that somebody's wrong to us, that then we can begin to justify our behavior based on the actions that have been brought against us. Now we're going to see if that holds up today, and we're going to try to understand a little bit deeper why that is not the truth, and why Jesus is able to come at us and be able to open us up to a reality that will cause us to experience freedom emotionally. Now for most of us, what happens when we're feeling uh, the pain and we begin to move into the suffering, a few of the choice activities or tools that we pick up are the following. One, we try to get the other person who has wronged us to change their behavior. You know, you mother, you did something to me, you stink, and I, I'm going to get you to change your behavior. Also, some of us, when we start to feel a certain way, we feel uh, opposed, we feel offended, we try to escape the way that we're feeling through a number of different vices. We could lay them out here, but it's not necessary. I think we understand what those could be. And so we try to escape through some form of, of thing that will cause us. It could be shopping. It could be something destructive. It doesn't matter what it is, but the tool that we pick up happens to be that. Also, I know it's not but here, anyone here in this room, but sometimes we retaliate. You know, God said an instruction to us that when you take it in context makes a whole lot of sense because he knows its power and its destructive force. He says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I don't like that sometimes because, no, I'm fine, God. I'll go ahead and handle this myself. That person did me wrong. Vengeance is mine, says Brad, who is the Lord of his life. But God says, no, I want to lead you to the best possible way to live. It's not yours. The reason why it's not yours is because you can't handle it. And many of us know what that's like when somebody's done us wrong or hurt us. We try to make things right by sticking it to them, but we never truly get satisfaction. Mick Jagger was wrong. You can't really get the satisfaction that you want. I got a lot of them today. Don't worry. Um, it just, it doesn't work. And I've seen people come through some crazy stuff. I mean, beyond crazy. I've seen people that have been stabbed and sexually molested and abused. Uh, we talked about a few weeks ago, Nick Vachusik, the gentleman who was born as a congenital amputee without arms or legs. I have seen people that your pain does not compare to their pain, but it doesn't really matter because we're going to explain the process of how pain unfolds in our lives, but we've all seen people go through some stuff and be able to come out of that stuff with success. And we want to know, how is that possible? Because my mom just didn't read me bedtime stories, and I'm still, excuse my term, I'm still pissed at her. Yes, I said it in a sermon, but there's not a better word for it, right? I mean, you compare some of the things that you have been through and some of the situations, and we're going to explain how it happens. So we know that these tools are, are not producing the, the blueprint that we see in front of us. God says, here's the blueprint. I'm going to lead you to life beyond your wildest imaginations. Here, here's, here's a set of tools, but we pick up all these other tools, and we end up just kind of messing things up. So the question is, is what, what's the right tool? What's the right tool to pick up? What do I do when a person has done, has, I've lent them money and they haven't paid me back? What do I do when, when the significant other has just gone off the deep end, when they're, when they're saying things and doing things that are completely crazy? What do I do when my boss just doesn't, doesn't give me 
the, the, the accolades that I deserve? What do I do when, when somebody snubs me or sneers me? And that, that person, they knew I was standing right there, but they didn't even say anything to me. And what do I do when that person posts that thing on Facebook? They know, they know what they mean to do when they do what they do. And I know that they know, that we know that they know it. And they did it because they were directing it to be a specific way to me. Jesus gives us the tool, and the tool only works if you use it with the blueprint and you actually activate it. But the number one tool that we can pull from our toolbox is the, the ability to surrender the right to judge. So Matthew 7, 1 through 2 says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. This passage of, of Scripture is not talking about God. It is talking about our relationships with each other. How do I know that? Because it goes on to dive into relationships between people. And also, I also know because of the finished work of the cross that God, and, and he promised us, when, when, if you look in Isaiah, when God gave the rainbow to Noah, he told him that he would never again be mad at mankind and there would never be destruction or a flood in that magnitude ever again. Which is why when preachers get on TV and say because an earthquake or a hurricane is happening in some city that God is mad at people, that you can think, no, 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 you're wrong, 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 because he dealt with his anger and judgment through the finished work of the cross. And when somebody says something like that, they just don't understand or they have not gotten to a place in their relationship with the God that they understand his character and his heart. Because I can tell you this, God is not mad at people. He loves them. Just the same way when your kid who's been hopped up on sugar by Mr. Terry goes crazy. <laughs> Where is, <laughs> is he in here? Oh, no, when he goes crazy, you can love your kid, right? I mean, when they go nuts and say the craziest things, and sometimes your children may say, I hate you. And you're like, I love you because you're my kid. God loves us that same way. And then he says, here's, here's what happens. Parallel scripture is in Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Men will give into your bosom. He's not talking about money. He is talking about relationships and emotions. That, in other words, what we tend to do is we tend to place judgments on little things that, that people do. Now, it is going berserk right now. I just see this happening all the time, everywhere. I mean, let me, let me try to draw some out, okay? I mean, let's, let's imagine that, um, oh, gosh, let's, let's take, take a look at it. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at work in uh, um, I got called, called out, you know, and in my mind, I interpreted the situation to mean, this might be my last day, and I have no, I, I have no idea why. And, and so I went ahead and, you know, started to, in my brain, just sort of pack my, my bags and my things. I don't know why. Our brains just do that. Anybody ever, stuff happens, you're like, this is it. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm like, geez, all right. And then I get outside the door, and, and my boss proceeds to have a conversation with me about something that's happening in his life. And that he needs me to, to just sort of be, be able to be an encouragement. I, I won't go into the details of it. And do you know how awesome I felt? <laughs> As a self-centered moron, thinking about himself only. Now, you're laughing at me, but let me laugh at you for a second, okay? I mean, how many of us when we see, maybe, maybe we observe a couple of people getting together for a lunch or something like that, or maybe we find out about a party that goes on, and don't act like you don't do this, because you do, and then a few mo months later, or weeks later, or a few days later, you find out, or maybe it's on Facebook, you see pictures, how dare they, and you weren't invited to that party, and what do you do automatically? You think, those mothers, they don't like me, they, I can't believe it, I, I, I'm right? 100%. We all do it. Look around the room, everybody just say, yep, I do it. Um, sometimes I try to get over that, but I do that. Now, <clears throat> the, 
God, God opens us up to the ability because he knows that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, that we have a, a, something that we feel like is our right. We feel like we can judge the motives of other people, which God says that, that is not something you can handle. That, that is not. Because there are about a zillion things going on, and, and, and you have no idea why a person does what they do. You don't. And he says, if you want to be free from the suffering that is optional, then you can surrender the right to judge situations, and you can actually experience emotional freedom in your life. It's my gift to you. Now, if we start to look at how bad this affects us, let's go back to our childhoods. Because I've heard stories of complete, utter craziness where I've, I've talked to people and counseled people who have been stabbed by their parents, whose step-parents hated them, abused them, did all kinds of things to them. Then I've had people who've, who've actually been in, in situations where maybe their parents um, went through a tough time financially, and, 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 and the, the, the dad had to work a sales job, and so he had to work a lot of late hours. But the child then has judged the situation as dad abandoning them and feeling the real feelings of abandonment that they then carry on into their life. And they consistently look at situations and get into then relationships with people of the opposite sex and begin to feel those same real emotions. And they're, they're suffering. Man, I, 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 I like to just kind of talk about some of the situations where I go through because as I begin to look at this, I, I see in my own life where this is a reality, and I'm tired of it. Times when maybe a parent doesn't call on the right day, and look at them, you know. You know, I've said to my wife before, my God, I mean, we are going to be way better parents than our parents. God forbid. You have never said that, have you? You've never looked at your parents and thought, they are doing things and have done things that are so screwed up and blah, blah, blah. Now, going back to what I told you as far as the tool is concerned, yes, pain happens. Yeah, mom may have been able to make it to a few more baseball games. But when I decide that I am going to be God and decide that I know why my mother decided not to go or couldn't make it to the games that I held so preciously dear, I put myself on the roller coaster of misery. Has anybody done that? Yeah, you have. Don't raise your hand. Yeah. Now, this goes into our marriage relationships. It goes into our friendships. And all of a sudden, we start to do it on all the little things. I've ne I mean, I, I don't know, but um, I, I'll just, I'll wear it today. I'll wear it. You know, there could be situations that I come in the door and I think to myself, oh, why isn't this done? You know, wife, why have you forsaken me? You know, <laughs> you did this because you just this, that, and the other, and this means this. And, and, and cause friction and stress and pressure. And meanwhile, I don't know really why. It's not my right to do that. And can you imagine what our lives would be like if we lived utilizing the tools that God's given to us to be able to experience the best possible life? You, you think to yourself, no, nobody, I must repay these acts that have been done to me. No, not true. There's a difference between observing something and judging it. There's a difference if I lend money to you and then you don't pay me back. I don't have to determine why you didn't pay the money back. I can just, based on your track record, not give you money anymore because of your track record, which is what we should do. Because sometimes the tool that we pull out is forgiving and re-forgiving and re-forgiving and forgiving. No, no. There is the ability, for, are you with me this morning? Okay, are you getting anything? All right. Is, we have the ability to observe and not judge. We don't know why we do things. You know, it could be, and this has happened to me over the years a lot, okay? I mean, I, for sure, I mean, I remember preaching uh, one of our first Sundays, and I, and, I, and I had been talking about a trip I took to India, okay? And I decided to make a comment that I thought would be <laughs> funny. 
And I said, you know, you know, I mean, I was in the villages of India and my heart and motive was pure in it. I just decided, I was like, boy, you know, you're in India too long when the women in the villages start to look good. Now, I'm sure that's wrong on so many levels, okay? It is, all right? But somebody decided to be the judge and jury of why I said that. And, and they tried to kill me. No, they didn't. I'm just joking. Oh. No, and I remember being like, wow, I didn't mean it like that. I mean, I love, I love the people in India. I've been there, but I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. Just, you can take it and be like, oh my God, you guys can get together and be like, can you, can you believe you said that? All right, it was like eight years ago, okay? So just lay off, all right? I've grown up so much since then. Um, <laughs> But there's other things. There's other little things that happen, right? There's other little things that take place. And, you know, we do and make judgments against one another for a lot of different reasons. I mean, God forbid you've done this. Sure, surely you've never walked into even this church facility and looked at somebody and been like, I just don't like them. Look at that. Look at Brad's striped sweater. I mean, look at, look at Brett's beard. I mean, his mustache wax. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, you, you've got a hundred different reasons. And so what do you do? You, you create suffering. And the next time they sneeze the wrong way, you immediately judge because you think you know that why people do what they do. You know how much awesome ability we would have to, to, to experience love and goodness Aren't you tired like I am of having to be a person that decides that? I mean, has it really done you any good? Has it made your friendships richer? Has it made your relationships more meaningful? Is your marriage stronger than ever? No. And we're all in the same boat because we all do it. And, and the, the word always brings us back to an understanding, Matthew 5, 22, I tell you that anyone who's angry with her bro a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. All these passages of scripture that we read, they show us what happens. When we get into a place where we're constantly doing that, it just, it reciprocates right back to us. So now if I'm looking um, at, at TJ and his tie and making judgments of TJ and thinking that, geez, look at him. I mean, God, he didn't wear his shoes on stage during worship. Can you believe him? You know, and look at all this and I've got all these ideas. It comes back to me. Because I create a cycle of pain, and it, it, it needs to end. It, it needs to end. Because we're, we're, we're a group of people, and in, in the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, that love is not touchy or oversensitive. I mean, that would help a lot of us, you know? All of us on a, any given day. Because we are over the top sensitive to everything. And I'm saying that because I'm noticing that in everybody. Everybody is sensitive. Uh, everybody is trying to respond and judge one another. We, we've got an outbreak of conversations, political ones on Facebook. And I'm just thinking, you know, hold on a second here. You know, there, there's got to be a better way. You know, we, we, we immediately, when someone says something, immediately we pass judgment on why they said what they said. But the truth is, is we don't really know why. That's why... The responsibility is on us to get to know people. Because when we start walking around and determining why people do what they do, we put ourselves in the suffering end of things, and it just keeps going on. And like I said, anybody have anger issues? Don't raise your hand, because it's all of you. I'm just joking. The reason those get seated in us has to do with things that we won't let go of. Because we're constantly judging situations. Now, it's parents, it's friends, it's spouses. This doesn't leave any of us untouched. Every one of us is in that, this same position because of how we do it. But I'm gonna tell you, if we're gonna be able to experience what God has for us, if we're gonna truly get the blueprint, see the tools, but then experience it, then we have to become a people that will surrender the right to judge. We have to become a place in a community where people feel safe and vulnerable. And the only way that happens is when we surrender the right to judge each other and we start to understand how we can actually create wholeness in relationships. 
if you say something to me and I get the stir to be offended, I can just say, listen, Paul, when you told me my beard wasn't awesome, it made me feel like, you know, th this. Is that what you meant? And if Paul says, yep, I can say, okay, great, thanks for telling me. Or Paul can be like, no, dude, I was just messing with you, man. I mean, when I looked at you and went, I was thinking about something else. And, and instead of us being a group of, of uber, you know, sensitive people, we can actually become a people that learn how to manage and navigate relationships. One thing I know about all of us is because of the cycle of craziness that we've experienced in our own lives and families, we, we, haven't, we haven't really flexed our muscles in these areas to grow. And because we haven't flexed our muscles to grow, the reason why, you know, on the scale of one to 100, why a lot of us are at five and 10% is because we've really never seen that blueprint relationally. And so we've just kind of gone about it. Are you with me this morning? We've just gone about it trying to do what we do. You know, and I, it's funny when I look back early on in my, in my uh, relationship with my parents, and I've said this before, you know, I had a choice growing up. My parents w were divorced. And, um, and I remember being in, in uh, high school and uh, either having a chance to like hang out with all the people who talked about how their parents didn't love them and because they, they, they were divorced and they didn't see them and that. And then, you know, other friends who were married, you know, I made a good choice. I could have e very easily decided to not do that and spend my time in that misery. But I decided to, to hang out with, with friends that had good, good family structure. And, and, I, and I really, I loved it. And, and it gave me some safety instead of spending my time perpetuating the misery. Are you with me? And, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because I think some of us, you know, when we think, um, you know, surrender the right to judge. I mean, if, if I don't have the right to judge, who am I? You know? I mean, that's how I build my relationships. We get together. And we talk about everybody and how they're so screwed up and how we're so awesome. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, I mean... Do, do, do the, the majority of, of your connection with your work relationships talk about how much you hate your boss and how stupid he is? Some of us it is. Some of us, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we gather friendships by being a group of people who are against stuff. I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not really a friendship. It's not really a relationship. And we've, we've, we have the opportunity to not judge. We have an opportunity to not react we have an opportunity to, to downgrade from being a group of people who are just living on, on the fringe of the hairline razor of, of our emotions. But it's going to take work. I keep doing this. I'm trapping myself back here. Are you with me? Yes. It, it's going to take work, but it's worth it. It's going to take wor work to start to adjust and, and start to develop a plan for our lives and to develop a structure and habit that, that is going to bring us to wholeness. It's going to take work for us to start to get into environments where we start to establish our hearts and we start to, to base our emotions on things that are healthier. But it's worth it. And if we're going to become and accept the hero challenge, then in this area, we, we, we've got to make some movement and, and be able to establish ourselves and, and become proactive rather than reactive. And so what happens? Our relationships get better. We sleep easier. We actually, the longevity of our life, because the current structure of, of pain and suffering that we're going through is wreaking havoc on our bodies. The illness and, and the sickness and the dis-ease that's coming from it, tell me, do you know what I'm talking about? How many of you stressing and over you know, complicating and judging situations has made things in life fun and enjoyable. Well, guess what? We're, we're all in the mix of this. Now, what if a group of people in a church started to work towards that healing and wholeness? What if a group of people who allowed themselves to fall every now and again, and you may not like my sweater that I wear and judge it and think, oh my God, he's such, he's such a nerd. He's, a, he's, he's like one of those, you know, preppy kids, you know, and you don't know me. You don't know me. I'm sorry. What if we drop that? And what if tattoos and, and beehive hairdos, you don't, you don't even know what that is, but some people might, uh, uh, full-length dresses and, and short 
skirts, I don't know why I said that, uh, wearing shorts in church. What if, what, if, what if we just come? What if we don't judge each other? What if we create an environment where instead of that, there, there's a place where people can grow? What if, what if we come and instead of deciding which, which area we're at, what if we get to know one another first? And instead of buying chicken sandwiches, you know, to prove our points, what if we start to live in a way that would reflect the vision? Yeah, I know some of you don't even know what I said, why I said that, but that's all right. Don't worry about it. You're like, what? Because the world is craving you and I to give them a vision of, of the instructions that are in this book. But because what they feel from us is judgment and hypocrisy, none of it makes any sense to them. And out of one side of our mouths, we say that we're all about this, but we're always against something. And they're waiting for you to be for something. If, if you believe that the instructions are here for the best possible life and the best possible relationship, then let's get on board with the vision and instruction to be able to have that relationship by not judging and being so oversensitive with one another and allowing God to bring healing to our hearts so that we can walk in and make observations and not judgments and begin to have real meaningful relationships. Are you with me? It's going to open us up because then we're going to stop looking at the way that people dress and the things that people say and we're going to start to really care about their hearts because that's all that God cares about. Right? He cares about that more than anything. And so what is going to happen here is we are going to, we're going to, we're going to start to create a master plan. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to guide you in how to do it. We'll call it a life plan, a map, creating a master plan, whatever, for the areas of your life to be able to develop it and write it down. I mean, Habakkuk's pretty clear. You know, I could leave you today and just be like, don't judge people, see ya, you know? But I know that when we, you walk out the door, your husband's going to say he wants to go to that one restaurant, and you're going to be like, God, you always want to go to your restaurant. Why is it always about you? Everything is about you. And then you're going to maybe, you know, get into an argument because I've been to church for a long time and I've dealt with people. And then the rest of your day is going to be horrible, right? No. Okay. You're not going to do that. <laughs> it can happen sometimes. All right. But if we begin to look at where we want to go, because everybody ends up somewhere, but not everybody ends up somewhere on purpose. If we look at where we want to go and we begin to create and write down where we want to be. I do this a lot in pre-marriage counseling where somebody will, they'll say, listen, this is what we want. We're so in love. We love each other. We love, 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 love each other. And we're just, it's so great. We're so great. And we love each other. And I'm like, awesome. But let's write down an emotional impact statement. Where do you want to be in five years? What do you want it to feel like? What do you, want, what do you see? Give me a picture, an image. You know, I want to be walking hand in hand on the beach, my hair flowing. And us just, you know, better friends, deeper friends. But if you've never written that down, then when, when times get tough, you have nothing to go back to, and all you're doing is trying to wing it. Now, I bring that up for pre-marriage counseling, but how about your life? How about your, your friendships? I mean, where do you want to be six months from now in your friendships? Do you want to have some good ones? Do you want to have people that you can count on that you love? And you may already have some, but do you want to be a better friend? Do you want to be, and, and this will be the question that we, 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 we start with next week, and you can think about it all this next week, is when you imagine a group of people surrounding this box, and they're all there, and they're all looking in. It's morbid, but this is your funeral. And they're talking, and they're saying things. What, what are they saying? What a great guy. Man, that guy just went and served, or girl, they just, they were so wonderful to be around. And they were, they, it's just, you felt like you could come to them with anything. And, or would they say something else? God, I just, that guy was high strung. Who knows? Jeez, man. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. If we want to accept the challenge to become the leaders of our lives, and we say, you know what, God's given us tools, and I want to put these tools to use because I want the best possible life. And my desire is to live well, 
and to lead well is to leave a legacy for my children and to walk in accordance with, with the truth of God's word so that I can be, begin to give my kids a picture of how to treat their mom so that they don't have to live in the judgment cycle of pain that I've been through. If you have been abused, your parents were alcoholics, if you have gone through some crazy situation, I, I know the justice part of us, the vengeance side of us, feels justified by our behavior and activity to, to tell those people you did me wrong. I mean, I, I remember hearing a story, and I'll close with this, of, of a, a, f- a friend of mine who was telling me about his, his brother-in-law, and he said, you know, his brother-in-law was raised in an environment where he just could never do the right thing for his dad, and just always his dad kind of was, was really tough on him, and you never, you know, you're never going to mount to much, and you know, the son-in-law was just fueled by that. Just, I mean, bitterly fueled by it to the, to the point that he made a success of himself. And the first time he, he ever made, you know, a significant amount of money in, in check, you know, he, he brought it to his dad. And he said, see this? You said I'd never mean anything. You know, I'd never be anything. And I was, and I was my, my friend was telling me this almost like it, you know, this is awesome, a success story. I'm like, my God, that's horrid. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like, yeah, see, see this? Yeah, you didn't think I could do that. And I'm like, that must be a miserable life. And you and I, while we may not take it to that extreme, or maybe we do, we do that on a pretty consistent basis in the way that we respond and we react because of our judgments to each other. And man, do I want to see and experience freedom from that. Man, do I want us to be able to do that. We can, we can be free. We can experience emotional freedom. We don't have to. And we can work towards becoming stronger and better. And we can work in, in, a, in a community of people where we, we hold each other as people we can count on, which is what accountability means. People you can count on. But sometimes when people are working off of nine different ideas in their head of what success is, it gets a little bit crazy. So let's stick to this one. You know, the idea and understanding of God's value and worth for us and the idea and understanding that God wants us to have rich relationships. But us going around getting hurt by little infractions that come up every other second of every other day is nonsense, right? I mean, why? I don't know why you're not Facebook friends with that person. Um, (laughs) I don't know why they're not following you on Twitter. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't invite you to the party but you don't know why either. And it just doesn't matter. You can grow and you can be whole and you can be healthy and God wants to move in your life and he wants to be able to do some radical things. And it all starts when we surrender our right to judge. Amen? Amen. Bow your head and close your eyes with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We do. We thank you that it brings light and life. Thank you, God, that you are always bringing us to something better and that you want Um, really the quality of our life and the emotional quality of our life to be great. That you came more, for more than just for us to go to heaven. I mean, you want our life right now to be better than anything we could ever imagine. In fact, you said that you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, now comes the understanding of how to act upon that. Now comes undoing and unraveling a life that's been immersed in judging and and pain and torment and misery. Now comes back steps to take a a perspective shift, a paradigm shift so that we can be able to uh, accept your goodness and your grace and your love so that we can experience the quality of life that you have for us. This morning, God, we offer up our judgments to you, the, the the judgments that we've placed on other people, the judgments that we've placed on our friends, our spouses, our churches, our community, our coworkers, our bosses. We don't know. We don't know why we didn't get that promotion and it doesn't matter because we can end the suffering and start to operate in your supernatural goodness and abundance because you're the Lord of our lives. I'm not, we're not. Father, we release and open up our lives to the fact that we are not God of everything and all, but that you are. And that your ways and your thoughts, they're higher than ours. They're better than ours. And you lead us and navigate and and move us 
into better places. And some of us, we've judged you, God, because of our current circumstances, our current lack of something. We, we've judged you. We've determined that the reason this thing happened was because of you. And that is a, a major mistake on our part. Father, we surrender that idea. We surrender that pain and misery right now because we want to have a relationship with you, not based on judgments, but based on the reality of the finished work of the cross. And this morning, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're here and you are ready to take a step like I am, to say, you know what? I am ready to surrender judging in the judgments that I've placed on family and friends and co-workers and pastors and other people that have just made me miserable. Would you be courageous enough while everyone else is not looking <laughs> to raise your hand and say, that's me. Pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. God, in this moment, in this opportunity, right here on December the 2nd, 2012, we have no idea of the situations and stuff that will come up in the next few days, moments, years. We have no idea. But Father, we surrender even that need to, to know and to figure out so that we can live in this present moment and take this day with these steps to be able to let go of fear, anxiety, stress, so that we can be able to experience the true emotional freedom and the real relationships that you have come to give us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said.